you, Father, to uh, be blessed by our singing to you. And uh, Father, may we be blessed in, in just hearing the praises of your people. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As morning dawns and evening days, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart. Just take a few moments and greet those around you and welcome everyone to our service today. Just every chance he gets, he's going to go over there and do something. Let's uh, read some scripture together, would you? Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will be, be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's goodness with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. And all God's people said, Amen. I could barely read it back there. And well, that's bigger, but the scripture was a lot smaller. And then I was switching to the translation. I memorized that originally, and that was kind of messing you guys up. And so, but in the Lord's uh, word, so good for us. The scripture says, devote yourself to the public reading of the word of God. And that's what we just did. Now let's praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I
perfect father that loves us but it's in Christ alone um, that we find our hope in Christ alone my hope is found he is my life my strength my song this
as we prepare for uh, the Lord's table. We're going to sing a, a fairly new song, I think, to you. You might know this one. It's called The Old Rugged Cross. And, uh, well, you probably know this one. On a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the tears stand.
for our visitors, we have two cups stacked inside each other. The bottom cup has the piece of bread, the top has the juice. All right, now, <clears throat> I know some, of, I mean, there's probably a few that came to service this morning that are, you know, don't have a care in the world, that, you know, no worries, no distractions. They're here, they're eager to listen to Pastor Jay and learn from him, All right? There's others here that seem to be what, carrying all the cares of the world on their shoulders. These people have trouble focusing. They're, you know, distracted. You know, they want to listen to Jay, but they've got too much going on in their minds right now. Right? And this kind of reminds me of the story of Martha and Mary. They <clears throat> had Jesus and the 12 apostles were coming to visit them at their house. They were going to have dinner there. So both Martha and Mary, their sisters, they were preparing all day, getting everything ready. And then Jesus and the apostles show up. And Mary stops doing all work. And she goes and sits at the feet of Jesus to listen. She wants to eagerly listen to Jesus. Martha was still working. In fact, <laughs> she realized every time she looked up, there's Mary just sitting there. We got a lot of work to do. We got to get this ready for dinner. So she goes over to Jesus and says, Jesus, I'm working my fingers to the bone. Tell my sister to get off her backside and get up and help me. You know, and then Jesus' response is in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 41, where he says, Martha, Martha. Can't you just picture Jesus going, Martha? <laughs> you know, just kind of shaking his head. You know, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. <clears throat> I mean, he's telling her, you know, you got so much going on in your mind. You're so distracted about all of this stuff. You know what? That doesn't matter. I have to admit, on most Sunday mornings, I identify more with Martha than I do with Mary. I'm trying to get everything ready, get everything perfect before the service, cleaning after the service. Now, I try. You know, once I get in here in the service and begin worship, I really try to focus. But if I'm honest, I'm not always successful. Which brings us to the challenge I want to give each of us today at the table. See, we live in a world where so much around us wants to tell us we don't have time to just stop and listen to Jesus. I mean, we got our clocks, we got work schedules, we got even the news is telling us you don't have time to just stop and listen. The challenge is, that's what's most needed right now, is for us to stop and listen. So we have to answer this question. Can you, can I, say no to all of the distractions around us, but say yes to Jesus? Because only then will he give us his presence and then through that, his peace, regardless of what's going on around us. So as we 
take this little piece of bread, cracker, a symbol of Jesus' body, the body he sacrificed freely for us. Ask Jesus to reveal to you, what can I focus my body on to serve you and serve your body? Take the bread thankfully. Take the cup of juice, a symbol of the blood that Jesus shed for the forgiveness of our sins. He shed that blood, his own blood, freely. Ask him to reveal what we need to do individually and as a church to focus our hearts, our minds, solely on the face of Jesus. Drink it, thank you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we take time this morning to stop and sit at the feet of Jesus, Lord, we pray that you will teach us. We willingly give ourselves, all of us, to you today. Please, Lord, help us to live each day focusing on your face, focusing on what you want us to do so that we can receive your peace that surpasses all understanding. When we do that, Lord, that's when all of the pressing needs around us will just fade away. And we'll realize they're just not that important. We pray this, Lord, in the name of our living, loving, and returning Lord Jesus. Amen. Take time to remind everyone of another act of worship that we do, and that's the taking up of our tithes and offerings. We've got a plate in the back where you can drop it in the plate, or you can give online. It's safe, it's secure. One advantage online, you can schedule it so it will do it automatically and you don't have to remember to write a check on Sunday morning. But <clears throat> the important thing is that you can give thankfully because God first gave to you. That's why the Bible says he wants a cheerful giver. Not one that's doing it, oh, I've got to give it again. No. Give because you're thankful, because we really are that blessed that we should not feel obligated, but be glad to give back to God. <clears throat> and our missionaries of the month are Paul and Ashley Perry. They live in Brazil. They have a ranch there where they train a lot of pastors native pastors to plant churches. They also have built a couple of boats, boats, one of them a medical boat that they take along the Amazon River to you know, bring medicine and medical care to the tribes along the Amazon. So they've got a really neat ministry there and it's our privilege to partner with them and we're you know, just so thankful for that. So let's say a quick prayer for Paul and Ashley Perry you know, and then we'll bring Pastor Jay up. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up Paul and Ashley Perry to you and just thank you for their long-term ministry in Brazil. And thank you for their uh, blessing them with, you know, so much ability to reach not only around them and bring the gospel and train pastors, but also to reach you know, into tribes along the Amazon River, bringing medicine and supplies to them, Lord. They just thank you for their many years of service, and we just pray that you continue to bless them, protect them, and just help their ministry to continue to grow and spread the good news. 
We thank you for our opportunity to partner with them and just help us, Lord, to be better servants and better ambassadors with them, spreading your good news. We now lift up a special prayer for Pastor Jay and just pray that your wisdom, your message of truth and love will flow through him and may our hearts and minds be receptive to your word. We pray this in Christ's holy, holy, holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alan. This time the kids can be dismissed. And as they're being dismissed, I'd like to invite some of you older folks to go back in memory lane. How many of you are old enough to have heard these words from your mom or from maybe your dad? If I hear you say that one more time, I am going to wash, what? Finish it with me. Wash your mouths out with soap. Young people, that was something that your grandparents, that's the way they abused us. They, uh, they uh, if we had a little potty mouth, unclean mouth, we had one, one, uh, one alternative. For us, it was a big bar of dial soap. And I only ever remember that happening once. My sister all the time, she was foul mouth. No, not really. I'm just kidding. She was real sweet. Uh, but I only remember that one time. But that's all it took, by the way, one time. No, in honesty, twice. The second time was a wash rag with a little bit of Dawn. And that cleans you out too. I just want to know that, okay? James is offering in chapter 3 one of the most definitive discussions of pure speech in the Bible. And if he could speak today, I think he would emphasize the need for some folks to wash their mouths out, as it were, spiritually. I mentioned this last week, but is it not true that it seems like as a culture it's getting worse and worse as far as the, the foul language? I mean, now it's just not, um, it, it's not anything to even hear little kids uh, swear and cuss on the blue streak. And, and yet, Jam according to James, how we speak, in fact, if you remember back in chapter 1 of James, and if you could turn the stage lights up just a little bit brighter, I could see my, there we go. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, James 1, 26, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. And so the genuineness of your faith is demonstrated by your speaking. Now keep that clear. It's not that if you talk right or do right, then you have faith. No, if you have genuine faith, it's going to be reflected in your language. And because the mouth is such a clear indicator of our hearts, in chapter 3, James gives us a clear, uh, compelling reasons why the person of faith needs to learn to control their tongue. Now, I want to tell you, this is a tough message for me to preach, and mostly because it's a tough message for me to live. Um, I struggle in this area like many of you. Yeah, I, I literally was in Sunday school this week saying, don't talk, don't talk, don't talk, don't talk. Because last week when I had the week off because we had a missionary speaker, I didn't do very good on controlling my tongue. In fact, I want to publicly apologize, Sharon. I said something mean to you, and, 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 it, and it was mean. Everybody, you know it's mean when the whole class goes, whoa, like that. Yeah. I was like... Maybe I crossed the line a little bit there, a little bit, and tried to justify it and thought, well, she started it and all sorts of uh, stuff. But I realized, no, that's, man, the, the tongue is a hard one to control. And it's especially hard for those of us that are extroverts, amen? We, we have to talk to see what we're saying, even to see if we agree with ourselves, right? We're, we're the ones, we, we can change minds in mid-sentence. We're, we're blamming on about something eloquently, and then we say, but I'm not really sure I believe that now that I see what I have said, and I'd like to retract a little bit of that. And anybody else out there, please, any, all right, that's, the yeah, opposites attract, you all are introverts. All right, I struggle for this all the time. But we see in five, five reasons why we need to control the tongue in chapter 3. Let's read the passage together. Chapter 3, verse 1, Not many should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature, able to control his whole body, or the whole body. Now if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we direct their whole bodies. 
And consider ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how small, a small fire sets ablaze a large forest. And the tongue is a fire. Um, the tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among our members. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish is tame and has been tamed by humankind. But no one can tame the tongue. No one can tame, no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word as we study together in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, five points, two of them we made last week. The first was the potential for the tongue uh, to bring condemnation. And the danger is both for the teacher and for the listeners. For the teacher, he said, not many should become teachers because you know that we who will receive a stricter judgment. As a rule, I tend to talk more than anybody else in this church as my responsibilities and job uh, dictates. And so I will stand in greater judgment than the rest of you when it comes to the judgment day, and I understand that. But also notice verse 2, we, we all stumble in many ways. Um, part of why it's so important that I don't mess up in this regard is because I'm the guy that's supposed to be helping you not to stumble. And if I myself stumble in this area, how can I, how can I help anybody else? It's, it, it really is. There's a potential to bring condemnation because what did Jesus say? Out of the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, what? Speaks. And so if you see me with a speech problem, you just know right away I have a heart problem. When I know that you have a speech problem, I automatically know you have a heart problem. That's why I'm never really that big. I've, I've, I've never, I don't know that I've ever asked somebody to stop swearing in my life. I've come close. I've got a neighbor that swears a lot <laughs> and uh, gets to shouting and cussing and everything. And yesterday I was real tempted to walk over and say, hey, bud, why don't you pipe down a little bit and... Uh, and, you know, I've got, I've got neighbors, and my neighbors are, yeah, they're fun. Um, one of them swears a lot, and he's always in a mess. Another one's in a mess, and, and I've got drunk neighbors that come over and want to argue with me when they're drunk. I'm just like, <laughs> don't talk to drunk people, folks. That's all I got to say to you. It, 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 it annoys you more than it annoys them. I just want you to know that. Uh, how did I get on this? Oh, yeah, we got to be careful. Just remember lane, Yeah. The, the tongue can bring condemnation. Oh, I know why. I'm never really that upset when someone's swearing or whatever because it, it's just showing me where they are and it shows me what I need to do. Um, in fact, I kind of like it when someone is coming up and they're swearing, they're dropping the F-bomb and they're blah, blah, this, blah, blah. And then they go, what the F do you do for a living? You know, and I go, I'm a pastor. <laughs> it's so fun to watch what they just... <laughs> Yo, I'm sorry. I've had people apologize uh, over and over for talking the way they were. And I'm like, oh, I'm kind of glad I got to see the real you before we put up the facade, you know. Uh, so uh, don't be put off by language. Just know that that's a heart that needs the Lord. Amen. I'm telling that to myself. So say amen back to me. So I'll stop doing that with my neighbors. There's also the potential for the tongue to control. And we spend a little, the remainder of our time on that in verses 2 through 5 about and, and again, we, we talked about these bits and, and horses and little rudders on ships. And with the horse, you need the bit so that uh, the internal pressure to want to bolt and run and not do what God wants helps us control that. Ships, it's the external winds that blow it around. But one thing I failed to mention last week that I learned this week is that in both instances, it's really the person holding the reins to the bit is the one that's in control. It's the pilot that's guiding the ship. And so once again, you find this overarching theme over this message is that your tongue simply reveals who's got the reins in your life. 
who's turning your rudder. And if you are, then you probably have a problem in this area. If the Lord is, then you're going to be good, right? That's where we're headed. Now let's look at the, at the third lesson from the tongue, and that is the potential for it to corrupt. And this is not, this is not um, pleasant news. So too, though, the tongue is a small part of the body. Verse 5, it boasts great things. Consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large forest. In this, in, in describing this destructive power of the sun, he just gives this declaration. And unlike water, fire multiplies. You can pour a cup of water on the ground and you have what? You have a wet spot, right? But if you, if you spark a fire, um, all of a sudden you can, you can have a real problem on your hands. Um, I pulled up a picture from online of, of a fire, if you'll go to the picture slide there, Dee, That was in Pine Creek. That was just a little community a few miles north of where we lived in, in Montana in Paradise Valley. And that fire was one of the few fires that we were up close and personal with because we lived in the area that they were, um, at one point, were con- they weren't sure if they were going to get this thing under control and, and we were under the, you know, preparation for being evacuated and so since we were already past the barricades and stuff, I hopped on my motorcycle and I ran up here to, to Pine Creek and, and I sat there and I watched a home destroyed in fire. And to be honest, I used to be a fireman, so it fascinated me a little bit. But when I watched this beautiful home that sat on the edge of the of East, East River Road go up in flames, later to learn the story that the, the, the woman that lived there, the woman that owned the home, she was in her home and, and a neighbor came and said, Hey, uh, did you hear there's a fire? And she said, no, I hadn't heard. She said, we got to get out of here. And she literally grabbed her, her purse and her car keys and got in her car. And, and as they were getting into the car, the flames were coming up the little draw there up Pine Creek. And she, they barely escaped as they drove away. Her house uh, was consumed in flames instantly. And to be honest, when I sat there watching that, it just made my heart sick, and I turned around and drove back home. I wasn't really wanting to watch any more of it. Um, 12,000 acres, five homes burned. Um, a couple of big those propane, propane tanks exploded. You've heard that blast throughout the valley. And, and it all started from a guy on a backhoe, scraped some rocks with the shovel into the back row, and it started a little fire. He tried to get it out, but the winds kicked up. He couldn't. It had been dry. And I mean, within moments, it was, uh, you know, such destruction. And that's simply an illustration of the tongue, verse 6, the explanation of his illustration. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a fire. Isn't it true? Your words, (laughs) your words can torch people, folks. Your words can ruin your life and others. And, And comparing the tongue to a fire is is not anything new. Uh, Proverbs sixteen twenty seven says a worthless person digs up evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. And verse six is one of the strongest statements ever made on the danger of speech, and it describes the the just the the terrible nature of our tongue. And it says it's a it describes it this way. First, it says it's a system or a world of unrighteousness. Now, your translations may say world, but that's from the Greek term cosmos, which doesn't refer to the earth itself. It's talking about the world's evil system. James is saying that your tongue is a system of unrighteous expression that is in rebellion against God. Have you ever thought, why is it that most people that have nothing to do with God, and if you pushed them on it, they'd say they don't even necessarily believe in God. One of the first swear words they use is the phrase God, you know, and you can finish the phrase. Why is it even the unbelievers use the Lord's name in vain when they're swearing? What, What You wouldn't think that if they didn't believe in God, why don't they say Buddha dang it or something like that, you know? Why do they always use God's name? It's because it comes from that world, that system of unrighteousness that is in rebellion against God. And now, I would just want to say again, 
I'm not preaching this message to you so you can give holy, holy, un, you know, holy mean stares to people that are swearing. I, I don't want you to glare at people that are swearing and say you're an unrighteous dude. You know, he probably knows that. I, I say that so when you hear that, you can have compassion on somebody that they're so far from God that they think no thought of taking the Lord's name in vain. It gives you an idea of where their heart is, and you've got the answer for that. But the tongue also, verse 6, continues. It's a, a world of unrighteousness. It says it's placed among our members. It stains the whole body. It's the, it's the focal point. It's, when, it's where people watch when you're talking. They're either looking at your eyes or your face, and they, they hear your words. It says it stains. It defiles, some of your translations say. The word means to pollute. It refers to something that has been contaminated. In my translation, the ESV rightly translated it stain. It's that dirt that's so ingrained in the fabric of your life that you can't get it out. And sometimes your words are something that when you say them, you, you can't wash them out so easy, right? Sometimes you have to just live with your stain. And I'm not trying to bring grief or despair to you and you say, well, it's pretty obvious here what you're saying, you know. Yes, it, it affects us all. Hopefully I'll give you a little bit of encouragement before the end of this message. But the third bad news about the tongue is that it infects the entire course of our life. It says it stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire. Now, your translation may vary when it says that the, the, the Greek phrase literally says, is setting on fire the circle or the wheel of your life. In other words, the influence of the tongue carries beyond the individual. It carries to people, to circumstances in every person's life. And there's no part of your being that is not influenced by words. Someone says something terrible to you, it doesn't even have to be true, and it will devastate you. Have you ever experience that someone says something that's even false and how is it that we can't just go well that's not true and then just move on with no care in the world why you know they used to say sticks and stones may what break our bones but words will what names will never hurt me that is the biggest lie ever names hurt a lot i was called names when i was younger that i am not going to tell you what they were because some of you would you know use that and see how well i've grown in christ or not you know i don't tell you because they hurt and guys i the only the only real fight i ever got into in high school was a guy called me a name and he knew he was going to call it and i told him don't say it he said it and i walked over there and three of them actually and i walked right in the middle of them now unfortunately i had been reading Louis Lamar and the Sackets, Louis Lamar, a Western writer, about the Sackets as much as I was reading my Bible. And in that moment, I switched over to Louis Lamar. And like Tyrell Sackett, I walked right in the middle of him. And there was no more time for talking. I just started swinging. Knocked the first guy, hit him in the mouth, knocked him down. Second guy took off running, chasing the third guy. And then, then my Bible reading kicked in. And it was like, are you going to witness to him now? And I felt so bad. I was like, Went back over and helping the guy up. I'm like, I'm so sorry. You shouldn't have said that to me. You know, everything. That's, I don't know if that was a good apology or not, but I mean, he started it, right? You know, whatever. Man, it's embarrassing. And, and it stains you. It stains you. Can't imagine what those guys would think if they found out I was a preacher today. That guy? Well, yeah, names hurt. That's where I got it. That wasn't in my notes, by the way. Names hurt. I'm just saying, the tongue is so bad. There's no part of your life it doesn't influence. In fact, verse 6, lest we think it's, he's had all to say about it. No, he says the tongue itself is set on fire by hell. Your tongue is fueled by hell. Now, the other thing I wrote in my notes was, wow, wow. You think James is trying to get our attention? By the way, this is the only place where this word hell, Gehenna, is used outside the Gospels. The only other um, 
person that used this word was Jesus. He spoke of Gehenna, hell. It was that valley that became the dump outside of Jerusalem where there would be constant fires, constant uh, where the poor went to scavenge. It was, a, it was a terrible, dark, burning, stinking, worm place. It was a bad spot. And James says, that's what fuels your tongue. You say, wow, Pastor, I'm really glad we came here today to receive such great encouragement from you. Well, the end of the message is coming, so hold on, hold on, fasten your pew belts. Because the fourth problem with or the, the potential of, the, of your tongue is, is the, to contend, to just, you know, to kick against the goads. It says... Every kind of animal, bird, reptile, fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind. But no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. It's interesting that that which can be contained or tamed is the animals. And if you've ever been to SeaWorld or a circus or, a circus or Bush Gardens, we, we always love going to Bush Gardens in Florida. If you're going to, don't go to Disney, go to Bush Gardens. It's so much cooler. Because it's got all the rides, but then they've got these animals. They've got these giant sea, you know, I mean, or Sea World. Sea World is my other favorite place. The, I kept the, the big sea creature. Yeah, real technical scientific term, right? For killer whale, right? Not really a fish, but mammal. But these things are massive. They're amazing. And yet they've got them flipping and dancing and singing and coming up and riding. I mean, it's amazing. And now, to me, the crazy guys are the ones that get in with the with the bears and with the cats, the big cat. I've always been afraid of the big cats and the bears. Um, and they're, you know, they're predators. We're food. I tend to stay away from them. But I'll sometimes watch with fascination where a big old grizzly bear that's eight times the size of some guy is out there hugging him and everything, and he's mouthing on his arm and everything. I'm thinking he'd just rip that arm off and eat it. But, you know, isn't it amazing how we can tame everything like that? But... A man's tongue cannot be tamed. No one can tame the tongue. Two reasons are given in verse 8. It's a restless evil. It never quits. It's never satisfied. You ever wondered why you always have to have the last word? Anybody out there that always have to have the last word? You should all raise your hand. Yeah. <clears throat> we either say it out loud or to ourselves, right? But we all, why can't we just stop, you know? That's why it always works when somebody's upset to just go up and say, just calm down. That always works every time, right? <laughs> or just hush up. It, it doesn't work, right? It's a restless evil. It's bad to the bone. It's full of deadly poison. How bad? It's full. It's deadly. It's poison. It'll kill you. Your tongue is bad, bad, bad. You, can you say amen so we can go on with this? But now notice that James says it can't be, it can't, James doesn't say it can't be tamed. He says no human being can tame the tongue. What is it that tames our tongue? It's the Holy Spirit of God. That's right. It's God. But before we get there, we have one more bad issue with the tongue. That's the potential to compromise. And we'll just cover this quick. That, that first is, he makes this ob observation about Jewish life, and he's a Jewish author writing to Jewish folks. He says, with the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Now for us, we can think, oh yeah, we're in here singing on Sunday. Do you realize that three times a day, devout Jews pronounced 18 benedictions that all ended with, blessed be the Lord thou God. 18 times, three times a day. They were blessing God all the time. And yet, with the same tongue that they said, bless God, they turn around and curse man who was in God's image. Blessing and cursing, verse 10, come out of the same mouth. And his conclusion is, brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Then he uses three illustrations from nature. He says, does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Actually, four. I wrote three, but the spring is used twice here. A fig tree, can it produce olives? No. A grapevine, produce figs? No. 
a salt water spring. Have you ever come across a, a salt water spring? Probably not in this area of Montana they have them. Water's alkali and salty, and you wouldn't go there for a cup of cold water. Why? None of that works. You say, well, why does he say all this? And why these examples from nature? Why the, the, the spring, the fig, the vine, the salt spring? Why? Because in each of those examples in nature, we discover this truth. What you are determines what you produce. You can't just change your tongue if you haven't changed your heart. And by the way, you can't change your heart. God has to change it, right? Remember the prayer? I've said it many times, those of you who know me a long time. I can't, Lord, but you never said I could. You can, Lord, and you always said you would. Right? We can't change ourselves. But we can't, well, well, we can't control the old tongue just by saying, okay, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be nice. That'll last a few minutes, maybe. It'll last one Sunday school class. Sharon, I'm not sure how I'll do next week. But, you know, it's, it, yeah, you have to be changed from the inside. You have to change your heart. And so when someone's swearing at you and you're going, wow, what's your beef? Listen, don't try to change them by just controlling their life. They need a heart change, amen? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to close with this. Because one way you say, well, okay, I've accepted Christ and I'm still struggling with my tongue. That is probably a reality that all of us face. But that's where you have to continually be giving yourself over to the fruit of the Spirit, to the control of the Spirit. And, and that's not just this passive exercise where you say, okay, Spirit, you take over. I'm going to be, a, and then I'll trust in you to fix me. No, it says, finally, all of you, verse 8, be like-minded and sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. You see, there's, 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 there are steps you can do. There's, there's things you can move forward and you can become compassionate, humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult. And for some of us, that's the hardest thing ever, right? Somebody zings us and we want to what? Because zing right back. And you don't have to do it. But on the contrary, giving a blessing. Next time someone swears at you, just say, God bless you, brother. You got a heart problem. If you want to know how to fix that, I know the person that can change you. I know that sounds snarky. <laughs> All right, maybe, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll test it out and see, and then I'll let you know. I'll get back with you on that. Since you were called to this, so you may inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and to see good deeds, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Here's how you do it. Let him turn away from evil and do what is good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. Folks, it's I've in order to change my tongue, I have to be changed from the inside and I just have to turn over my tongue to, to my God. And I have to say, Lord, this is your mouth. May I only speak the words you would have me to say. Let's pray. Father, help us to see that we can't fix ourselves. We need you desperately. But Father, help us to be reminded even what what you taught us last week, that Father, if we can control our tongues, then we can control the whole of our lives. And so May that be a, a focus for us. May that be something we spend a lot of time thinking about and praying about. Even this afternoon, Father, may we just uh, take a time to be quiet before you and, uh, and to seek you. And Father, if someone's here, for those, if someone's here and they, and they don't know you, Father, as their Lord and Savior, I pray that this would be the day that they would trust in your Son, Jesus Christ, alone for their salvation. For those of us that are saved, God, may we lean on the Holy Spirit to give us the fruit of self-control, which we desperately need. And may our tongues and may the words of our mouth be acceptable in your sight. May they bless instead of curse. And may folks know that we love you because we love them. This I pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. So now I can tell you guys, go forth and be nice, okay? <laughs> Speak words of kindness and no zinging back. And I'm going to do my best at the door not to do that to you too and so i might test you a little bit just to see how you're doing but you can't zing me back okay that's how we'll <laughs> does that seem fair probably not but you know there we are god bless you guys 
Uh, one more thing real quick. Next, uh, let's see, next Sunday. Jeff, is next Sunday when you guys had a, Oh, no, that's two weeks. Two weeks. Be here two weeks from now. We're going to send the kids off. we got seven boys going down to uh, Florida for a week at camp. And so we're trusting the Lord's going to do something great in their lives. And Jeff and David are going too. So we'll trust that the Lord might do something great in their lives. Get David saved or whatever, you know. We're just looking forward to sending those guys. So we want to have a prayer. So in two weeks, we're going to, after service, we'll gather out there in a circle and we'll pray for those kids and send them off to Florida. And uh, we'll have to really work hard at blessing them, not wanting to go ourselves. So, all right. God bless you. Thank you. We'll see you soon.